gospel today is from the uh, gospel of St. Mark, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 24th verse that is found on page 51 of your pew Bible. Jesus says, But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So have you ever noticed that Pastor Bob and Pastor Craig and I and probably most pastors that you've heard preach all start our sermons with that same thing? Have you ever wondered why we do that? What was the first verse of the 1 Corinthians text? Paul's letter to 1 Corinthians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul says. And he says that in uh, the beginning of almost every letter that he wrote. Why? Paul is reminding the community of what binds them together. He writes to them out of their common connection and relationship with God the Father and Jesus the Christ. And he offers them grace and peace. But it's not just Paul's grace and peace he offers. He's offering God's grace and God's peace. And everything Paul says to them in this letter is grounded in God's grace and peace. And that's important to remember because a lot of what Paul says in this letter is criticizing the community for their behavior. So it's important for them to know that Paul is not just picking on them. He's trying to bring them back to who Jesus called them to be. It's a reminder that no matter what else was going on in their lives or in the church or in the world, they and we as a community are grounded in God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. No matter how different we may be, we all share that common bond. And Paul mentions then the spiritual gifts that we've all been given. And as they wait for the coming and revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we talk about the gifts that we've been given, and sometimes we talk about what we're supposed to do with these gifts. And yes, these gifts are to help us in our living out our faith every day, here and now. But it's not just about now. Especially during the season of Advent, we need to remember we've been given these gifts to help us during this long journey ahead of us, this journey leading up to the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul says. And we generally don't think much, if at all, about Jesus coming again. I mean, we hear about it sometimes, but we really don't spend any time in our normal everyday lives thinking about Jesus coming again. I mean, we know he will intellectually, we know that. I mean, we confess it in the creeds in church, we hear it in scripture, we sing it in our songs sometimes, and every year at Advent we talk about it but we really don't think he'll come back in our lifetime. I mean, I know I've thought, well, you know, he hasn't come back in over 2,000 years. What are the chances that he's going to come back in my lifetime? Pretty slim, right? But one of the things that 
Paul is talking about in his letter to Corinth is that Christ will come again and that this community was living in that in-between time between Christ's first coming and his second. And we call that the already and not yet. So Christ Jesus has already come. He has already been born and lived and died and was resurrected, but he will come again, but not yet. So we live in that same in-between time, between those two bookends of his already but not yet. Jesus says that even he doesn't know when he'll come again. The, only the Father knows. It always makes me laugh when I hear people or some group that claims that they know when Jesus is coming back. And it's, you know, how could they possibly know when Jesus himself didn't know, right? So we may think, well, it hasn't happened yet. It could be hundreds or even thousands of years from now. So what? What difference does that make? It doesn't affect me in my everyday life, so why should I even think about it, right? In the Gospel of Mark, though, the attitude is very different. Mark's attitude seems to be, well, since we have no idea when Jesus will return, it could be today. It could be after lunch this afternoon. It could be tonight before we go to bed. So we should be waiting with anticipation and being eagerly and excitedly waiting, kind of like children before Christmas. They just can't stand waiting anymore. Or it's like waiting for someone you love to come home when you haven't seen them in a long time. But it's so hard to kind of maintain that level of excitement and anticipation, especially we have so many things and important things in our lives that distract us from that. Paul talks about that, though. That's one of the main other focus in his letters, I think, is that what are we supposed to do as we wait? I mean, pretty soon we'll be celebrating the miracle of Jesus' birth at Christmas, and it's so easy to get all wrapped up in the cute little baby Jesus and the amazing miracle and gift he is to the world. But what God is doing is not over and done. God's work didn't end with the birth or even resurrection of Jesus. There's still more to be done. There's more to be revealed. There's more ministry and work to be done in the world. And that's where our spiritual gifts come in. That we have been given these amazing gifts in our baptism through the gift of the Holy Spirit. There are a lot of baptisms happening this weekend here at Good Shepherd. And each and every one of these babies who are baptized will be given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they'll all be given gifts to use in their lives to spread the word and share the joy of Jesus. Part of our lives after we're baptized is to discover what those gifts are and how to use them. And it's not that using our gifts or working, doing work in the world will earn our way into heaven. I mean, we know that. It's about using our gifts as a response to the joy and relationship we have with Jesus, the Son of God. Sometimes it's hard to know, though, what our gifts are. And sometimes it's especially hard to even know what we're supposed to do with them. And I discovered in visiting with somebody this week, um, one way to use our gifts, and I'm just going to warn you, I'm going to get all teary when I tell this story, so just be, you know, be prepared. <laughs> so I visited with somebody this week, and she had just found out that she had cancer, and she went to the pharmacy to go pick up her chemotherapy <coughs> pills. And the pharmacist came to her and said, do you, do you realize how much this is going to cost with your insurance? And she said no. She figured it would be $20, 30 maybe $40. Well, the pharmacist came to her and said, it's over $400. And the woman started to cry because she couldn't afford it. The woman behind her in line stepped up and paid for her prescription. That is the Holy Spirit. That is living out your calling as a disciple of Christ. Now, clearly we cannot all do that. I mean, I certainly don't have an extra $400 laying around that I can just give away to somebody. But there are things we can do. 
Because this waiting that we're doing in Advent and all of our lives is not a passive, just sitting around waiting for something to happen. It's an active waiting. Actively doing ministry and work in the world on behalf of Jesus. Maybe we don't have $400, but maybe we have $10 or $5 or even a dollar that we can donate to the food bank or a shelter or some other charity or even the offering basket here at church. Maybe we have a little time that we can offer even once a month to be part of some team or committee or something here at church. Maybe we like to bake and we can offer our gift of baking for a fellowship on a Sunday morning or at the well tonight or at a funeral dinner or some other function here. Maybe we can pick up the phone and call someone we haven't talked to in a while. Especially at this time of year, it's very difficult to be alone, especially if you've lost someone you love this year. Your call or text or tweet or Facebook message or however you do that can mean the world to someone who needs to know that they're loved, not just by you, but by God. Or maybe we can work to end injustice and prejudice in our communities. I mean, we've all seen all too well the effects of prejudice and violence in our country recently with the controversy in Ferguson, Missouri, and the people's reaction to what happened there. We, all of us, can be the ones to remind each other and the world of who God created us to be. We can be the ones to share that grace and peace of God to remind each other and the world of our common bond in Christ. That no matter what color our skin is, no matter what political party we belong to, whether we're rich or poor, we're all united through our baptism. We're all part of the same family of God. I know some of us, though, are so busy in our lives that we can't even find five minutes to do anything, and I get that, I do. <laughs> but can you pray? Can you pray and take a few minutes and pray for the church? Can you pray for someone you know who is struggling? Can you pray for our community or the world? And you may be surprised in your prayer that God is leading you and guiding you to some way that you can use the gifts you've been given to work for God in the world and to spread the good news. At the Thanksgiving Eve service, Pastor Bob talked about discipleship and what it means to be a disciple. Well, part of being a disciple is using our gifts to tell other people about Jesus, to work to help people in need, to pray for people who so desperately need to hear that God is with them and God loves them, to work to end injustice and so much more. Each and every one of us has gifts to share, and we've all been blessed by Christ and given the tools we need to show the world how much God loves them. I invite you during this time of Advent, this time of anticipation, to spend time in prayer, asking God to show you who and how and where you can use your gifts that God has given you. And maybe that first step is praying to be shown what gifts you even have. Or maybe you can share with the person sitting next to you what gifts you see that they have. This is a time of great anticipation, not only in the larger church, but here at Good Shepherd as we continue this transformational ministry process. God is alive and working here with you. And how exciting is it to think of all the ways that God is working and how God is leading us and how God plans to use all of us to further his work in the world. Because again, we're not just sharing ourselves, we're sharing the love and grace and peace of God the Father and his Son, Jesus the Christ. We can be the ones to remind the world what binds us all together, rather than what separates us. Because the world seems to be about reminding us what separates us, rather than what unites us. We are all grounded in Jesus. We are grounded in our baptism. And that joins us together with all the other Christians around the world. Like Paul, we're supposed to remind people of who they are and whose 
they are, to bring them back to who Jesus called them to be. We're called to use our gifts to help those around us, to tell the world about the love and grace and peace of God. What better gift to share during this Advent season and always? So go and share the good news of the love and grace and peace of God the Father and Jesus the Christ. Amen. <laughs>